What up, Danny? There he is, my man, yep. Mr. Hamong, hopping in. What's up, homie? What's going on? How are you? Uh, our newest member, Mark, who just joined the team today. He's going to be hopping in, too. Cool. Awesome. Where, where are you driving? Driving back to Cambridge, so back to Boston. Nice. And what is that sweatshirt you're wearing? Cape Cod. Cape Cod. Cape Cod. On the Cape. He likes Not the this. chips. We're on the Cape. Do. Cool, man. What's going on? Awesome. Well, we are in the middle of the Reddit Rebellion. I know. Straight up making money. I'm gonna let our I'm gonna let all our friends join us or anybody who might want to join us, and then we're gonna talk about the Reddit Rebellion first. That is how we're gonna kick off today. You buy so you buy. Now I, now I got a few minutes, so just so you know, I'm, I'm gonna hop off once most everybody's in. Okay, you can be the attendance monitor. That'll be perfect. Um, anybody make any anybody make any fun trades today, or is that just me? You. I do this thing called real estate, so I basically had to take the day off work just to trade. Cause I woke up, I woke up. Well, no, yesterday after hours, things started to get crazy, and now it's been like it's been a crazy week, man. <laughs> it's been a crazy what, week. What'd you I get? Mean, that that exp stock ain't looking too bad. I'm so glad that you gifted me all of yours. Yeah, exp's mm -hmm. exp's catching up. Um, it took a little breather. It was it was a little overheated. We had to put a little more water in the tank. Um, but that's okay. That's right. It's right where I thought it would be going into this split. I figured it would be at like a hundred, 110. When it hit 120, I started to get a little nervous because if it gets too high, right, then it's, then it's going to have some good. volatility and it's going to get crazy. So I like it right where it is. 110 bucks at the split, $55 a share, um, and then run back up to 75, 80 bucks. I think that's, I think that's the play that I'm calling. So, um, we will watch for what's going on at EXP. Right, and we are watching the Reddit Rebellion. So I snuck my way in this morning to a contract on AMC. So if you noticed, when we woke up this morning, AMC was up like 250%. Um, everything was frozen for a very long while. And then I snuck my way into a $6 call. So without anything really happening, I was able to double my, well, I, I'm about 144% on my AMC call that I snuck my way into. Don't even know how I got it. And then I bought 10 calls on Nokia for six bucks. And Nokia is the, the horse, the dark horse. So if anybody on this call prays, say a prayer that Nokia hits 100, because then I'm going to buy Joe Turco a new crown, a new princess tiara for everyone's pleasure. I didn't know we were talking stocks. I like this. We are. We're talking. So I just hopped in. We're so if you're just joining us, the big news today is we are in the middle of the Reddit rebellion, right? It's the internet yeah. versus Wall Street. And um, if you yeah. haven't checked it out yet, hop into um, Reddit. Wall Street bets is is amazing. It's crazy. It's crazy what people are doing. Um, if you didn't see Chamath on CNBC today, um, he actually hopped in yesterday and got in on the GameStop craziness. And he put a uh, hundred grand in and he turned it into 500 grand and he closed out his position this morning on, on GameStop. And he's donating all 500,000 to the Barstool Sports Fund for right. restaurants. Um, Chamath is this amazing guy who ran Facebook and he, he, he does a bunch of SPACs. He does a bunch of companies that I'm interested in that I invest in. And uh, hopefully we can recall our evil California governor and Chamath will take the job. So um, we're in the middle of some crazy stuff. So if anybody has any questions about the stock market, we're actually going to be teaching a class next week um, on Thursday that you guys are all welcome to join. Um, it's going to be, Meyer's going to teach it. He is the stock expert. Um, he does about five hours of research on stocks every single day. We pay for about 20 different services to give us tips and picks and ideas. And we'll be doing that all next week on Thursday. But in the meantime, if you guys have questions about kind of what we're looking at, um, what's going on with this thing, what the hell is Reddit? What is, what is Wall Street bets? 
what's a short squeeze, any types of random questions you guys have about the stock market or what's going on right now, fire away. I am happy to answer them to the best of my knowledge. What Did you is just better? learn about Wall Street bets? Sorry, one at a time. Uh, go ahead, Brad, right? Yeah, and no, I was just going to say, did you just hear about Wall Street bets because of what's going on this week? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I knew it was kind of a thing out there. I follow stock tweets a lot um, and look up a lot of that stuff for like momentum or like general market chatter, right? Like the, the dregs of the world that are going to tell me that, you know, uh, doggy coin is going to go to two bucks or whatever it is, right? So there's all these like weird underlying back channel, you know, high, like momentum trades or whatever, but... Yeah, it's uh, this this is a whole new level. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I mean, all those hedge funds out there manipulate the stocks every day. So every day. it's kind of nice that the uh, the common man is coming together to uh, do a little price manipulation and put some money in our pockets. So yeah. I it's agree. Just, you got to be smart. I bought all those last week, so I'm doing pretty well. Did you? Yeah, which, I, put, which, I, I didn't put a, I didn't put a ton in, but I put probably a thousand dollars into uh, GameStop when it was I don't know sixty bucks. Nice. Um, yeah. Well, um, did does anybody here trade options or just me? I actually don't know much about options, but I've been looking into it because that's a lot of people are talking about that now. Yeah, that's the multiplier. So yeah, I, I got burned by options because I didn't know that you had to sell your options. Well, sure. Uh, or they disappear. <laughs> so I, I lost a little bit of money. So I gotta I gotta be careful with my options. Yeah, so you can lose a lot of money in options. And there's different ways to trade options. There's ways to trade options with like unlimited upside, but basically the ability for it to go to zero. And most options expire worthless, like not, not most like 51%, but most like a lot, um, like 90%. So you want to be very careful when you get in those, you want to give yourself enough time. You want to have a target. You want to have a strategy. You want to get out with plenty of time left over. Very rarely will I hold an, an option to its actual expiration date. Um, very rarely will I exercise an option. Um, so anyway, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we can get into next week, but yeah, options are the way to kind of multiply it. So where Brad got into Reddit at 60, if he had taken that same thousand dollars and bought a $80 call or something, right. For, you know, a couple of weeks out or whatever it was that thousand bucks that's now turned into what five grand, something like that um you know four or five grand yeah. it would it would have been more worth like 50 or 60 grand or more oh god but then but then you could lose that much right no you can only lose what you put in so you oh, wow. max, your max loss would be the thousand dollars that you would put in i gotta look into this <laughs> yes you do which is all part of being a part of the team so welcome welcome to the team we're happy to help kind of educate you guys and get you filled in on, um, on what we're up to. Um, we actually have, you know, text messages and, and we, we put out kind of alerts and trades. And look, you need to, you need to have extra money. Uh, you need to have money you can lose. If, if you're, especially if you're gonna play options, like do not put money in options that you cannot afford to lose. Um, do not do it with the entirety of your account or your savings. Take a very small piece of that money and put it aside. You know, with most people that I coach directly one on one, um, I tell them, you know, throw $2,000 in a Robinhood account. We'll trade your options with two grand. And anytime that account gets too big, anytime it gets to four or 5,000, I want you to sell out of those positions. I want you to drain your account back to 2,000. And I want you to use that $3,000 profit or whatever to go pay off credit cards or you know put it in your savings or go put it in a long-term stock that you like in a retirement account or do something with it but what will happen is you'll go from 2000 to 5000 and then you'll be like whoa I'm on top of the world and you'll put all 5000 towards AMC calls buy a bunch of risky $25 AMC calls and next thing you know you know they pull the rug out from under you and your 5 grand goes down to you know 500 and, uh, and then you're like, shoot, man, I wish I listened to John and took that money off the table and brought myself back to 2000. Because with 2000, you don't have enough money to be dangerous. You don't have enough money to do anything stupid. You don't have enough money to go buy Tesla. Um, and so, you know, those are, that's where you get in the big leaks. If you guys have a hundred grand, you're willing to put on the line and possibly lose. Um, we could put some crazy 
uh, calls or puts in on Tesla. And that's where you get the multiplier. Um, our assistant, his name is Justin. Many of you might have talked to him. Um, we taught Justin how to trade options when he started working with us. He made $15,000 on his first trade. Um, which was about, uh, he, he had saved up about 65,000. He put uh, like 3,000 into a trade and he ended up with a $15,000 profit. So that was a really bad way to start trading options um, because that kind of spoils you and makes you think things are crazy. And then around Christmas, um, when he was bored at the office, he picked up some Tesla options and they went down a little bit and he freaked out and he lost 15 grand but if he had held them for an additional two weeks, they would have profited him $110,000. But he quit Whoa. too early. So you can make a ton of money. You can lose as much money as you put in. And there's, there's little safety met, uh, measures and nets that you can put in. So there's a finite loss on those. Hey, Nicole, what's up? You look nice. I can't hear you. You're muted. My bad. I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Are you filming video today? I did film a little bit and I'm late because I was filling out a referral agreement. So my bad. Mm -hmm. um, what same referral or a different one? Different one. One I just picked up for um, Ontario and the Inland Empire, mm -hmm. but I've just been out there doing the Chino Hill stuff. So it's adjacent. Hey, might as well. That's exactly. awesome. Congrats. Um, all right. Well, I was just going over a little bit of the, the hot news in the market and the life. You know, everybody's talking about the Reddit rebellion and these crazy stocks that are short squeezing to new heights. GameStop is you know, 330, 350, 400. They, they're trying to peg it at a thousand. I don't know what's up with that, but games, just for the record, GameStop is too rich for my blood. I'm not touching that thing, but I'm getting in on all the ancillary players, all these low float, high short, um, lower, you know, price stocks like AMC, um, Naked, NAKD, if anybody drinks Naked Juice, Naked is running like crazy right now. Joe's got to go. See you, Joey. Um, yeah. So anyway, if you guys have questions, just PM Black me, Bear, text yeah. me, let me know. Yeah. Blackberry is a good one. That one, that one should squeeze. Um, Build-A-Bear right now is, is being talked about, um, but there's a lot. It was fossil. I mean, half Anything that was up today, basically, in the market is part of this because the rest of the entire market was down. So that's the market. Um, what are you guys seeing out there? Tell me, tell me some success stories over the last week or tell me some, um, some things that you're seeing that you're struggling with, either one. Uh, that sweet um, offer that I got in one weekend that ended up falling through because of the inspection. So <laughs> back to square one. It happens. And it was it was too good to be true, right? That's right. Yeah. Easy, easy come, easy go. What was the problem with the inspection? Uh, they're like, uh, you know, first time home buyers. You know, I think they were kind of at the very top of their budget. We made a good offer, so um, they were kind of at the top of their budget. And then, you know, I think they were a little concerned about closing costs. Basically, they didn't have a lot of cash for closing and to get out of their lease they had like two months lease and then they got a little spooked by the fact that you know the appliances were a little bit older maybe quote unquote at the end of their lifespan yeah so i mean uh, i was disappointed but it is what it is on to the next one and we'll look for you know a uh, cheaper home but that's also probably where the bloodbath starts <laughs> we'll see what happens yeah, you run into parallel, like, uh, not parallel, what's that, cross, whatever. You, you run into this problem, right, where you start to peel the price down, but the competition goes up, or you look for a home that's more turnkey with less repairs needed, but the price goes up. So you're on this, like, teeter-totter of trying to find that sweet spot, and ultimately, like, you know, you just have to coach them through it. Um, they, they may kick themselves for not moving forward on that house. Uh, home warranty will usually cover a lot of the repairs, at least in the short term. I'd rather go buy appliances than buy a new house. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of little factors in there, but when they're uncomfortable, no matter what, like you may have moved too fast, 
They may have stretched a little too thin, got a little overexcited, right? So these are just things that you'll learn about in the future. If you had told me like, oh, the roof was shot or whatever, right? That would be more of a conversation of like, here are the big items that you wanna be looking for when you go in to show a property. So part of what I'm doing when I go show a property is I want to sell the property. I want to tell them about, you know, all the great things and hope that they love it and get it under contract. But a lot of what I'm doing when I'm showing the property is looking for things they're not thinking about. So for instance, like, hey, did you notice it's 10 o'clock in the morning and yeah, the pool looks amazing right now, but guess what? You know, at two o'clock in the afternoon, the pool is going to be completely dark and shaded and you're never going to swim in a pool that doesn't have afternoon sunlight on it. It's just never going to happen. Or, hey, did you notice the roof looks pretty shot? Um, you know, we, we may, we're probably going to have to get a new roof on this one at some point. You know, that's about $20,000, something along those lines. So, you know, big ticket items, um, chimneys or fireplaces that are falling over, um, structural damage or foundation issues that might be present. Um, you know, a lot of those bigger ticket items, those are the ones you kind of want to focus on. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah definitely. Great Thanks. A great rebuttal for appliances is always the fact that there's constantly sales around every freaking holiday. So President's Day, appliances will be super cheap. You can get a Best Buy card and do 0% interest for like two years and they can pay off the appliances like a hundred bucks a month or something. Um, and there's always holidays, right? There's like President's Day has big appliance sales, Memorial Day, Labor Day. Like there's times throughout the year where you can replace them at a much better cost. Yeah, or we, we advocate like the Sears outlet so we have a Sears outlet that I haven't been to since quarantine, but you know, you can get like a, a floor model or something with a ding on it or whatever. And the best way to sell people on stuff like that is to like use it yourself. So I always get my stuff dinged up at the, at the Sears. That way I tell them, I'm like, yeah, I bought a, you know, a washing machine and it was half the price and yeah, it has some nicks on it, but I don't give a shit. Like it's a washing machine. Like who cares? Right. So um, all right, cool. What else are you guys seeing out there? Nicole, I think you were going to say something before Brad jumped on. Oh, that was no? it. That was it. Anyone else have a win, a success story, something good to add? I got something, John. Right. Here, John. Uh, so today, actually, this morning, uh, my client beat out 25, 25 other offers for a multifamily. We had to go... Uh, we had to go $106,000 over asking price. Wow. Uh, what was, what yeah. was that the percentage? Uh, and so it was listed at five at five nine nine. So I, I, I can't 20, do math off the top of my head. 20, but. It's, tw it's over 20%. Yeah. That's crazy. Good yeah. Job. Thank you. Um, how does that affect the cash flow? For the multi? Yeah. Uh, uh, so we did uh, we did a rental analysis. Uh, it's a two unit. So the first unit is pretty bad and it needs to be updated. But the second unit is pretty updated. Um, so on the analysis, we found out that they could get realistically like twenty five to twenty six hundred a month, just based on what they're um, what they're offering. So that's almost their entire mortgage right there. Close to break even. Yeah. So we see a lot of that in yeah. our market too. So if you go to like a, a Phoenix or a Dallas or one of those hotter markets where the prices are a little lower, but the rents are really good, you, you know, especially if you go to like Arkansas or Detroit, right? You go to some of those lower price markets, you can find some really great cash flow. You can find some cap yeah. rates that at 5%, 6%, all the way up to like 12%. Right, I've seen in multifamily up to 12 or 13 percent cap rates, which is great. But what do those markets not have? Those markets don't have appreciation, right? They're not going to be an equity play, and so over time, you're not really going to get any juice out of it. You're just going to get the door. You're going to get the door and the cash flow, and you're you're going to pay down your equity over time. But it's not going to ratchet up in value. Then you get markets like Southern California, Boston, right, whatever, where you're not really going to get any cash flow. Right, the market is almost always going to peg it at break even. Because Dylan, are, for those people, is that strictly an investment property, or are they going to live in one? They're going to live in the first unit. Um, so yeah, a little bit, a little bit That's more cool. about what you're saying. There's a, there was another house they were looking at that was bought two months ago for five hundred eighty-five thousand. They put it on the market at six hundred eighty thousand, and it's contingent, and it is 
I think the foundation is sunken. Like it's so tilted. Like you can, you, you can basically walk, you feel like you're walking down a hill walking through the house. So, and they got, they're getting, I think 680,000, which is a hundred thousand dollars more than what they bought it for two months ago. It's a crazy market, man. It's yeah. wild. I mean, I had a listing, honestly, that I just sold that I'm selling right now, but um, you know, we, we could have bought it for, I don't know, 500 ish three months ago, if they'd sold, right. A comparable property that probably got taken off the market. We could have taken down around 500 something ish, right. The election, right. November was wonky. If you guys don't remember what happened in the last three months, right. Yeah. We got the Reddit rebellion and the, and the proletariat rising on the internet, but we've also had Trump and the Capitol was stormed and all this other crazy shit happened in the last three months. So back up to October, no, early November, there were deals out there, man. I was telling everybody I could get a hold of, now is the time to buy because I knew we were heading into this moment because we've now shed all that inventory going into the end of the year and we've just rock bottomed the inventory in most major markets. And now you throw this chunk of demand on and guess what guys, the full demand is not even here yet because people haven't even filed their taxes yet. So as people file their taxes, more and more and more borrowers are going to be able to qualify. And as those borrowers qualify, they're going to come flooding into the market. And right now, like in our market, we, we haven't moved a, a penny in, in terms of uh, supply, right? We haven't moved one house in terms of supply between the beginning of the year and today. And the reason for that is the market has determined that everything that's on the market is dog shit. And every new home that comes on the market that's even decent just gets swallowed up by the machine. It's a lot like a stock. So when you take a stock, right, let's, let's pick anything. Let's take AMC. And AMC is trying to get to 30 bucks, right? Because the Reddit boys want to want to pump AMC up to $30. Or the, the market movers want to push AMC down with their shorts, right? So there's all this friction around the $20 mark. But what happens is as those orders come in, as that demand flows through, all the sellers at 20 bucks get eaten up, right? And as those orders flow through, eventually they break through. And when they break through that $20 mark, boom, the price starts shooting up. The exact same thing is happening right now with the inventory. Every home that comes on gets eaten up by the demand and that's gonna push prices in almost a vertical fashion. And so you will see rapid appreciation. Only two things can stop this market. Appreciation so high that buyers can no longer afford it or interest rates moving up in a manner that causes buyers to no longer be able to afford it. And if both of those things happen at the same time, you will see a full flat line in the market. So what we wanna get back to, what we will get back to is market dynamics will happen. Demand will continue to churn through Supply will rise to meet demand because what happens, right? Why does supply come up? Well, supply comes up because prices come up. So if my house was worth 600,000 and I wasn't a seller and I wake up today and my house is worth 700,000 and I want to get the hell out of California or Boston or wherever, well, guess what? I'm a lot more likely to sell with that hundred thousand dollars of appreciation. And so now as more sellers come on because they like the pricing, you're going to have buyers kind of match up with that level of demand. And then everything can kind of normalize and real estate agents make the most money when there is an equal amount of buyers and sellers. When there's too few sellers, all the buyers get stuck in this, in this log jam, which is what we're in right now. And when there's too many sellers, buyers feel like, ah, I don't really need to buy it. What's it worth? Right? That's why one of the scariest markets that moves pricing down is when there's too much supply. And it's because buyers have no intrinsic motivation, right? There's nothing saying, hey, I need to take action on this because everything's telling them I can have any house I want. And if I wait, it's probably gonna be cheaper. We are a very, very, very far, far, far way from that moment. But, right, a, a very low inventory market is almost the same because all you guys probably work with more buyers than you do sellers. And it's very competitive out there for you, so. Um, hopefully that's a little helpful in kind of how to gauge all of that stuff. Um, Dylan, what did you do to win? So uh, 
yeah, so the, the agent is also with EXP. Um, so I noticed that. And when we went to the open house, I didn't, I, I don't tell Joe this, uh, anyone else on the Turco group, but um, when we went to the open house, I said to the agent that I was with EXP and I made it very clear that I was with EXP because I knew that that was a connection that we had. Um, and then I had my sellers write a letter uh, just basically introducing themselves, describing how much they love the property, things that they could see being uh, happening in the house, like their dog sunbathing on a little nook that's there. Um, and then I also had my, uh, had my sellers, um, yeah, I had them do that. And then I made sure I was very clear on the instructions of how the offer was submitted. So like you wanted one single PDF, did all that. Um, and then I also called them, like you said last week, uh, I called them and I just said, hey, you know, we're, we're about to put, we're putting in an offer here and, and what can we do to kind of put our best foot forward? And he gave me some, some good advice. And then on, around the second time I called him again and I was like, hey man, I know we're, we're up against seven other offers now. What can we do to be the, the number one? And he was and he was very open and honest to me because I feel like we had made that that rapport and we were able to um, able to work something out. So relationships are so important, and your rapport with that agent, like we talked about before, just setting the tone at the first showing request, providing good feedback, communicating openly, all that stuff, right? Even using the EXP angle. Um, the love letter. Look, I guarantee they didn't choose your client because they liked the dog imagery versus the price. I'm positive right. the price was what motivated them. But they also need to know that they're working with somebody who's professional, not an asshole, going to do what they say they're going to do, etc. cetera. Um, Nicole, you've killed it on your presentation, on your offers, on all this stuff. What do you want to add about you know getting your offer accepted or some of the strategies you're using? Uh, <clears throat> well, nine times out of 10, it's money. But Sure. it's money plus the X factor, right? And so there's three things. I just made a YouTube video about this. It'll go live tomorrow. Um, there's things that I personally do just because I like have to, I just have to do it. I have a high sense of urgency. So I really make my buyers commit to like two, maybe three locations. And I narrow down their must haves versus their nice to haves. And I only let them look at houses that have everything. We don't get distracted chasing other things all over the place. So that way, when a house does come on, whether or not I find it that day, it's, I find it the day it comes on the market. I immediately book the first possible showing if I know it's one that they're gonna wanna see. I don't even ask them. I just book ourselves in for the first showing. And that way, not only is the agent seeing my name first, like the more they see your name, the more they start to get familiar with you, they feel like they have a relationship with you. So that's like step one, is like just getting your name in front of them as the showing request, being the very first possible one on the PED, whatever. Just do what you have to do to get the first showing. Um, I don't care if your clients can't go, FaceTime them. You gotta just get in there as soon as you can. Um, it's, it's true, like, I'm sorry, in this market, it's true. It's um, so many, I, excuse my French, but so many agents are pussies. Like, yeah. good job just taking the bull by the horns and saying, you know what? I know what my clients want. I know the property. Like when you said, I see it before they do. I get it the minute it comes on the, like, you know your shit. You are on it. And, and then it, when my I, client brings it up to me in our group chat, I'm like, oh yeah, I booked this in for Saturday at 10. I just wanted to make sure we got it. Like, yeah. you're going to see it first. I already took care of it. Right. And you're um, just like polishing your nails while you're waiting for them to like, because you are ahead of them. You are driving this bus. You, you know, if everybody here could take that level of authority and ownership for the goals and the needs of their client, like, I love that you said, we're not wasting our time with shit that they're not going to like. I'm not, just because there's 10 houses on the market, we're not going to go see those 10. I maybe will them. show them one or two to show them how wrong they were in person. I'll be like, this is not what you want, but I'll, I'm happy to, I'm, and I always take the very customer service approach. Like, I'm so happy to go check it out for you. I'll take some video. I'll let you see what I think. Like, and then I point out all the things that it's ways it's not right. Um, so yeah, when the house comes on, you just got to be the first showing. Um, you've got to be like super into it with a listing agent. Um, and I always say like, it's no time to play coy. It's not dating. It's not like playing hard to get. Like, if you like the house, you need to get your offer in that day. 
the, if you're the first offer in, you're probably the best offer. And again, it's just the more the agent sees your name, the more they see you hustle, the more they see you committed, the more they want to work with you because they know that you're going to make their life easier. So it's terms, it's price, but it's also these little things that you can do that are well within your control that puts you ahead of everyone else. I saw you see, you do something the other day. What did you do? You said you were in emails and it, it ended up in your story and you were like, hey, just we had to we had to throw it out there one more time or something like that. You were kind of framing it like you were coming back in a negotiation, I think. And I saw your Yeah, yeah. So I had one where my clients hadn't seen it in person and it was the first one we put an offer in and I pulled for it really hard. And I said, listen, this house is completely turnkey. You're going to be happy here, but I, I can't wait for you to see it in person. You live in Ohio. Like you need to, if we're going to write an offer, we need to write an offer. And then being first time home buyers, they get a little touchy about price and max and we're well under their budget. We're well under their pre-approval but their cap on the escalation just wasn't aggressive enough. And so someone came in higher and they missed out on it. Never saw it in person, but they were a little bit bummed. That was their lesson. That was their learn, that was their hurt. And now the next time they were like, listen to Nicole. And now they ended up paying more for a house because you know, the next one's always a little bit more expensive, Brad. but here we are. <laughs> it's still going to be like the house for them, you know, and it's in this like great she, she like semi gated community in Chino Hills. It's got amazing schools. It's got everything they need. We're buying it from the original owners. And even now they're still a little bit like, Ooh, I don't know. And I'm like, it's fine. You can paint the kitchen. The kitchen's lime green. We'll move on. And, and that's another value add you bring in, right? Um, I had an agent teach me this a long time ago, one of my mentors. Um, he's no longer my mentor because he got so rich on his EXP stock. He was one of the first guys in at EXP when there were like four people. And he took EXP stock in lieu of a Christmas bonus when he knew Glenn was short on money. And nobody else knew. It was like a secret. And Glenn offered everybody EXP stock as a Christmas bonus when it was worthless. It was just paper. And he was like, oh, Glenn's hurting. I'll take the stock. Well, guess what? The stock is worth millions and millions of dollars. So he won't even take my calls anymore. No, I'm just kidding. We're still friends, but it's wealthy beyond measure. But he taught me one of the biggest assets you can provide as an agent for your buyers is an understanding of design, construction, renovation, expenses, right? If you can tell them while you're showing them property or when you're looking at property, how much it's going to cost to to put a beam up, to bridge a space, to open up some walls, or what it's gonna cost to paint a kitchen. You know, can you, can you paint the cabinets or do they have to be replaced? What's it gonna cost? What's the timeline? I just had a client ask me, they're like, yeah, we wanna, we wanna change these counters and we wanna redo the baths and all that stuff. How much does that cost? And I was like about 20 grand and it takes about two weeks. The only way I know that is because I just did it for a different client. And so the more you can get in on the renovation and design and architecture, if you can walk in and talk to a client about um, architecture and space and layouts and, um, and, and light, right? And proportions, um, some of these things that like, you know, you're not a door bitch. You're not here to just open a door and be like, hey, you like it or not. Like you need to be educated about construction processes and, you know, and, and how homes are really built. And like all those little facets, because if you can get clear on all those things, you're going to be a super agent, right? You're not just a realtor with a, with a license to hurt people. You are a professional who really understands the product in which you're dealing. And you can start to give them uh, solutions to their problems before they can become problems, right? Mm -hmm. Jen, on that escrow too. Mm -hmm. So they lost out on one. It was a little bit heartbreaking, but they got over it. We got into escrow on this one. We actually beat a cash offer that was also over asking because the, the agent liked us better is what it boiled down to. Like, he, you know, I'm not going to say who it was, but they were like, yeah, I don't know if I want to work with her. She's pretty old school. Relationships, right? Your reputation, right? You can build your reputation up over 20 years and lose it in five minutes. So your reputation is huge. The other thing is sometimes cash buyers are jerks, right? Like cash buyers can sometimes try and be bullies and, and try and, you know, redeal and renegotiate midway. So um, I like a, a nice, clean, you know, pre-approved buyer who's, who's doing it, you know, the old school way versus a bully with a bunch of cash that's trying to, trying to screw everybody over. Um, Dylan, mm -hmm. did you want to add something? I know you're out doing your 75 hard or whatever the hell you're doing right now, shoveling snow. <laughs> uh, yeah. What? No, I just dropped off the deposit check. So I, um, I'm walking back inside to my house, but oh, well, I, I wanted to. Uh, nice. Yeah, it was, it felt good. Um, I wanted to 
kind of ask you guys where you guys get that kind of um, what, what type of resources you use for that kind of information of like architectural design and uh, cons the, you know, the construction side of things, because I find that when I'm going on showings, I'm very much saying like, this could do that. You could do this here. You could do this here. And I'm, I'm really enjoying that process, but I want to add to it and add like for this much money, you could do this as well and add that kind of extra knowledge base. If you have really high end clients and you're at a certain price point, I recommend bringing a contractor with you. If you have a good relationship with one, like get someone who does remodeling. Um, and if they can come walk it with you, either once you're in escrow, you hopefully once it's a sure thing, hopefully to give you a better idea. The other only other way to do it is to just learn through experience, start going to home Depot, start, at, you know, learning the difference between free, you know, fabricated quartz versus marble and like what the cost differential is. You just need to start go out there and like learn that stuff. There's no other way to really do it. The best way to learn is by doing, right? Yeah. So when you have- When it comes to house stuff, okay. for yeah. sure. When you have a project, when you can bring a contractor in, when you can go get the bids, when you can help someone renovate before they list for sale, when you can do all this stuff, like Nicole did a, a multi-month long-term renovation on the house she bought. She learned a ton of stuff by doing her own project. And but I've done it on two listings already. And it's a value add that no one else can bring. And we're doing it on ours too, right? We're renovating properties before they hit the market so that they're turnkey and ready to go. And we're showing people where to spend the money to get the upside. And so, you know, those, those are, again, that's a unique value proposition that people don't have. But additionally, what you can do to practice, to learn ahead of time, is you can enlist the help of the people that you know who have done these things. So post on Facebook or Instagram and say, hey, DM me or let me know, raise your hand if you've done a home remodel anytime in the last two, two years. And then you can pick the brain. You can say, hey, how long did it take? Who did you use? Do you have good contractors? Can you refer to anyone? What was the biggest mistake you made? Like, you know, pick their brain, right? Go over to their house if they'll come over to see it. Ask them to see, um, ask them to see their before and after pictures. Right? A lot of times people will have um, before and after pictures for those types of things. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be your own personal experience. Um, other things you can do are start reading like design blogs, start offering, um, you know, read, read uh, Architectural Digest, right? Get some magazines and some things, right? Just for, um, th that's not gonna be applicable for like your real life day-to-day -day experience. Architectural Digest is like the nicest homes in the entire world, but it will teach you some really high level things. Like I have a mentor, people always talk to me like, I know Joe wants to talk more about like tapping into luxury. Like how do you get into luxury and blah, blah, blah. Well, one of the biggest things about getting into the luxury market is you have to be able to speak to the luxury market. If you don't know anything about art and auctions and antiques and expensive cars and amazing vacations and yachts and private jets and all this other shit, like you're not really in the conversation. And so if you don't have that kind of money, if you're not living that life, like I always advocate, people need to go experience the local resorts, go to the nicest places, check out the restaurants, go test drive a Porsche, like whatever that ends up being, right? Like get a little bit of that experience and then supplement the rest with like blogs and magazines and other ways that you can kind of get a peek behind, um, behind the scenes into that world. Um, and right, our vendor database. So if you don't have three good architects and three good contractors and three good tile guys and three good plumbers and three good everything, you need to build that up. Because if you take three of every category, you just added like 500 people to your database. And every single one of those people is a business owner. And you can tap into their network if you build a relationship with them over time and start to send them clients you might find that you're getting some of their database back in return. So don't miss the B2B stuff and don't be afraid to say, hey, I want to use you as my contractor. By the way, I'm just looking to learn. Could I come tag along with you sometime and check out some of your projects and get an idea of what you're doing or what you're recommending or what the hottest design trends are right now or all that shit, right? And I'm sure Pinterest too. Nicole, you wanted to add something? Careful with Pinterest, careful with design blogs, just because half those people don't know what they're talking about. Because um, you just don't want to advise a client wrong. Like you, it's something that you saw on a blog that they did it themselves for $500. Cool. It's going to cost three times as much to have a professional do it, but it's going to probably be a professional job, right? Like you get, you get what you pay for. So there's nothing wrong with saying like, hey, I don't know. But you know, once we're done here, I'm, by tomorrow, I'm going to get you a list of every like three different vendors you can reach out to for a more detailed quote. 
and do that legwork up front because if you tell mm -hmm. someone you're going to get them three vendors by tomorrow whatever you better have those people in your back pocket already because if you yep. pull up Yelp right now and you call 10 people, none of them are going to take your call. None of them are going to call you back. They're all going to be too busy. The pricing is going to be crazy. But if you have a relationship with somebody, then you, they know that you're going to send them a lot of business and then they'll bro you out and, and come do you a favor and look at it and whatever. But make sure the client does the hiring and the legwork so that you're not liable. Like that's a huge thing. Like we can't overstep. We can only point them towards people and like, Hey, I've had good experience with these people, but like, you're still responsible for vetting, hiring, paying. I'm just a facilitator. Correct. And make sure you give them multiple options. And that goes for everything. Home inspectors, you know, any vendor, anybody you're ever going to recommend because you know, occasionally, like I have this guy, he's a really good friend of mine. I trust him. I've known him for years. He's a great lender. And I followed up with one of my best clients who sends me a ton of business and he just helped her with a refi. And then she's like, yeah, what the hell is up with him? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, well, I was supposed to get this rebate and I didn't get the credit and da, 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 And she's like super pissed. And she sent me a ton of business and she's a physician. And she knows a ton of people. I'm like, I have no the idea. Girls get dicey. Yeah. First, first I've heard about it. Let me jump in. And then I'll teach you guys this one, write this down in big, bold letters. You guys all have your pens handy. Write this one down, run towards fire. So in business, you always want to run towards fire. The first chance, the first moment you find out something's wrong, something got super screwed up. Somebody calls you the day of closing, a week after closing, a year after closing, whatever. When there is a major fire in someone's life, run towards it and solve it. Many times agents will get shy and scared and feel like they screwed up and they'll say, oh, well, if I just ignore this, it'll go away. Well, guess what? Now you're going to be named in the lawsuit as well. If you step up as soon as you can and do everything legally and humanly possible to help, they'll usually leave you out of any future potential lawsuit or you'll be able to solve the problem for them. And then you get super kudos brownies points and you get a million referrals. But this it's idea- actually oh, if I just ignore this email for a little while and we don't talk about it, whatever, then like, it's the same thing with an overpriced listing. Like, you know, you know, it's overpriced. They know it's overpriced. They don't want to admit it, but, and the market knows it's overpriced because you're not getting any showings. And yet everybody wants to look at each other. Like, do you think the price is okay? Do you think the price, do you think is it okay? We'll just leave it. Well, no, it's not okay. Right. If you've gone two or three weeks in a market like this without showings or, or you got a bunch of showings and you didn't get any offers, it's overpriced. So call your sellers and say, hey, we need to talk about the price. And then you need to walk them through. You need to show them how many showings you've had. You need to say, hey, we had 10 showings. We got zero offers. That means it's overpriced. You need to tell them, hey, uh, we've had 1,000 views on Zillow, and yet no one's come to see it. We have 2,000 people in all of the internet between my Facebook ads, Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, Realtor.com, whatever. We've got all these eyeballs, and yet we have no showings. What do you think the problem is? Well, it's one of three things. It's always one of three things. One, availability. I can't get in to see it. I have tenants. I won't allow showings. There's a big dog. There's a thousand hurdles you have to climb to get into the house. There's no way to see the property. If I can't see it, I can't sell it. Availability, number one. Number two, condition. It's smelly, right? It doesn't show good. It's got bad carpet. Um, any type of conditional thing that you can do, staging, lighting, paint, whatever. There's a problem with the condition. It doesn't look good. Or three, if I can see it and it smells good and it looks good, it's always price. All right. Um, that I was fun. That. Thank you very yeah. much. Absolutely. I'm glad that was helpful. Um, what other questions do you guys have? What, do you, what else do you want to talk about? We got about 15 minutes left. I, I quick question. I obviously just came up, but I, I came in the middle of your vendor spiel. Yeah. You just like, so you just mentioned when you need a vendor and you, you look them up on Yelp or whatever, like they're not going to call you back, but do you just call vendors and try to call those vendors and try to like build relationships with them? That's the start. So the best way to start is by finding referrals from people you already know. So I asked my database, who do you know? So if you, if you want a great database touch, call everyone in your database and say, hey, what's up? Uh, what's up, Dylan? It's John. I just wanted to call and see how you're doing. Happy New Year. It's crazy world. Do you hear about the Reddit rebellion? How are things going? Blah, blah, blah. 
And Dylan's going to be like, great, John, da, 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 whatever, we shoot the shit, right? Family, occupation, recreation, dreams, right? We catch up. Hey, just two seconds before I let you go, I had a quick question. I'm building out my vendor database. Who is the most amazing business person you know? Who is your absolute favorite service professional? It, I know it's me, right? I know it's real estate. I know it's me. But aside from me, who is your favorite service professional? Do you have a in-home masseuse that you just love? Do you have a carpet cleaner that you swear by? Did the person who changed your roof change your life, right? Do you have the best car guy on the planet? Like if you'd asked me who my favorite service professionals are, I have a dentist I would jump in front of a bus for. Um, I've got a great painter. I got a good roofer. I've got, right, I've got a handful of people that like, if you say you want the best of my people, I got like five people that I would say like, they're special. My insurance person, amazing, amazing. And then I've got others where if, if a client called me and they were like, hey, do you know a contractor? I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> like I know a few. <laughs> like, I don't have one that I'm like passionate about, right? And so if you call a hundred or 200 people and you ask them for the very best person that they know, you're now going to get those A plus people in every single category. And then the follow-up question you ask them is thank you so much for giving me that dentist that is incredible that I'm gonna send all my clients to and I'm gonna to go to because I need a teeth cleaning or whatever. Who do you need? Who's the one person in your life that you're missing? Is it a great babysitter? Because I know you and your husband haven't gotten out for a date in three months. Yeah. Is it an amazing interior designer because you moved in two years ago and you're still on that shitty Ikea furniture from the studio that I sold you six years ago, right? What, who do you need? Is it a gardener? Because I drove by your house and your yard's looking a little trashy, right? Like, <laughs> what, what do you need? Those and are the, fighting words, John. Those are fighting words. Seriously, would you actually say that? Tell someone client? their yard looks like shit. <laughs> do, do, I, do I know my clients? Yeah, fine. You know which one you can say that to or not, I guess. Do you guys, do you guys think I know my clients? Yeah, you know your audience. I get it. Do you, do you guys think my clients know me? Probably, but yeah. Here's where you win. Here, Everyone on this call, this is where you win the business. You will always be the best version of you possible. Zillow will never be able to compete with Dylan. Zillow will never be a better Dylan than Dylan. N Nicole will always be the best Nicole. And so if Nicole tries to be Zillow or tries to be Dylan or tries to be John, she will fail. She will look like a fucking idiot. But if Nicole goes out every day and she is 100% Nicole, she will always win. And so it's, it's where you, this is where people fail with video is they think they have to be Ryan Serhant on video. Ryan Serhant is great on video because he is Ryan Serhant, right? And you will be great on video because you are yourself. If you try and be someone different, you will get called out on that shit 100 out of 100 times. The same way that if I called my database and I wasn't myself, they would know. They'd be like, that's bullshit. You're just being salesy. That's where the term salesy comes from. Salesy yeah. means you're pretending to be somebody that you're not. Right. So, so I call them, yes, and, we, and I would joke with them or whatever. And I may not say that, but if they asked me, if they said, well, what do you mean, what do I need? I would give them a couple examples. I'd be like, hey, I just helped, you know, Carlos find an amazing babysitter. And I just helped Sarah with an awesome yard guy to come clean up her landscaping because the last thing that Brad wants to do is, is redo the lawn or redo the landscaping over the weekend, right? We don't have time for that shit. So let me help you fix your life by putting you in touch with an amazing service professional who's going to help you get your time back. And so you stop looking at that ugly backyard that you're never going to get to, even though you say you're going to. I don't care how many Pinterest boards you have. And then ultimately, then I get to call, right? Then I call everybody and I'm like, hey, by the way, uh, do you need a great gardener? And then I go through five or six calls, right? And I eventually like 10 people need a gardener. And yeah. guess what? When I call Jose and I'm like, hey, Jose, what's up, man? Good news. I got 12 appointments set up for you over the next week. I have pimped you out to everyone in my database and we got a whole bunch of new clients for you. Guess what? He is thrilled that I just set the table with 10 to 12 new introductions. And guess what he's gonna do? He's gonna start referring me business. Yeah. And I'm gonna say, look, dude, I don't need 12 clients. I don't need 12 referrals today. Like I got you 12. I just need one. I need one referral in the next 12 months 
so that I can hit my goal. Is that fair? I gave you 12, you give me one. And everybody on the planet is going to say yes to that. What are your thoughts about a, a client being that person you refer? Absolutely. It should be. Everyone in your database. So t- first, first step, take your whole database. And this is hard because most of you don't have a database or it's not organized or you haven't gone through all this. You work but with Joe Turner. Really, you know we have databases, John. <laughs> when you really understand who your people are and how many of them are in there, you take the 200 or 300 people you have and then you figure out how many of them own their own business. So if you have 300 people in there, there should be 25 to 50 that own their own business that you can refer. Now, maybe they're not the guy who actually mows the lawn. Maybe they own the landscaping business. Maybe they're not the painter. They own a building company, right? It doesn't matter, but you can still refer them business in a way that matters. Or maybe it makes them look good at their job. Maybe they're not the owner of the company, but if they were able to bring in some new accounts to the business where they're an employee, their boss would be like, man, you're killing it. You just brought me four or five new accounts. No matter where they fall on the food chain, you're always going to be able to help people so long as you have that intersection. And then that brings me to one last thing, which is don't forget your small business friends with a side hustle. Anyone in your life, in your database, you should identify the people that have a side hustle and you should support the shit out of that side hustle. So those are the girls who sling the shampoo, the the shampire chicks, the Monat, Monet, whatever the hell you say it. Um, it, Herbalife, vitamins, uh, joggers, sweatpants. um, Pet wraps, the the sulfate-free wine, scout and cellar. All of it. All of it. All of it. just love that shit. Small business people love other small business people, 100%. And they they have no choice. Do you know how many people you have to talk to to make a living selling shampoo on the internet? A lot. So they do more talking to people than you do. So guess who this is going to be the realtor they recommend? If you buy up a bunch of their shampoo and give it out to all your clients as presents and introduce them and say, hey, you, you're, you got to buy shampoo anyway. You might as well buy it from Sarah because she's the shampoo queen. Guess what? Sarah is going to start sending all her business to you and you're going to make a disproportional profit. Sarah is going to make like 500 bucks a month with her multi-level thing and she's going to get maybe a new Cadillac. And you're going to make 500 grand this year and you're going to drive a Lambo and that's okay. You like that, Dylan? Was that good? Yeah, I know. I know. I'm thinking of someone who's exactly in the same position. They work for Mary Kay and (laughs) so I'm laughing. God bless. And And you laugh because you know, because it's true, because you recognize that this is a truth in your life and you can immediately, all of you, Every single one of you can think of the one person whose shit you always see online. And you're always like, damn, man, there they are hustling again, trying to sell that Mary Kay. She she actually, well, the last time I talked to her, that's exactly what she was talking about was getting that pink caddy. So (laughs) it's amazing. Amazing how this all works. Um, All right, last, let's open it up to questions. Last final quick fire questions. And then I want to hear what you guys learned today. I just want to say hi, Mark. I'm new to EXP. I hey, know Mark, Joe welcome. Turco from the Keller Williams days. Awesome. Welcome. And I totally, I, I totally agree about building the vendor database. That's how I sold my first property. Yes. You know, I had my painter lined up. I had to go into this lower level condo and have it repainted because it was so dark. Anybody walking into that condo would not buy it. And I said, absolutely. I'm going to bring my painter in. We're going to paint this thing. You know, I got it painted and that's how I got offers, you know, right away from day one of the listing, just because it looked nice. Welcome to EXP. Uh, we're excited to have you and I really appreciate you making me look good. So I will have uh, Joe give you that 20 bucks I owe you uh, after the call. <laughs> Who else has a rapid fire question <laughs> or a share, whatever you want to share? Nobody. All right. Uh, what'd you learn? Let's open it up. What'd you guys learn today? I learned that even though you're thinking you can do everything possible for your client, there's still so much more that you can do. And there's so much more that you can learn that, that even if you think you know a lot, you, you don't. <laughs> the day you stop learning, man, is the day you start falling by the wayside, right? There's new, there's new tips and tricks. I learn every single day. 
be learning based for the rest of your life because there's always somebody out there. You know, usually the people I like to learn from, you guys might like this, but one of my favorite things to do is to get around kids, seven, eight, nine, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. That, that is the best focus group in the world. If you want to get rich in life, figure out what seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds are into because that's the future. Those kids know more than you ever will. And they are going to set the trend on what's important and where money flows in the future. So never stop picking the brain of the youth, right? People, way too many people take, take kids for granted. And they, kids, are, kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. Um, all right, what else did you guys learn today? I got to start trading <laughs> options. <laughs> Brad's going to trade options. Awesome. We'll see you next Thursday at the stock class. That's Whoa, good. I traded options for a while. It's wild but fun. There we go. Chris is in. He'll be at stock class next week. Too. I lost like seven grand, but whatever. <laughs> hey, it's you. You invested seven thousand dollars in your education. I made thirty five hundred and one in like twelve minutes on Apple stock on on uh, oh. announcement day, though. So that's how they get you. Yeah. Uh, Hamong, you got one. Mark, you want to share again? Yeah, run towards the fire. Uh, when conflict arises, communicate like crazy, so that fire. the problem is addressed soon. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I actually, I actually love that. So some of you know, I'm, I'm actually a lawyer and like, I'm that guy. I'm the guy that like runs into the fire when everyone else is like, we don't know what to do. <clears throat> and like, sometimes you get burnt, but more often than not, you bring value and people like, remember that. And like, you now build a relationship that they come back to because they identify you as like the guy that will run into the fire and help them. And you have a good story, right? Absolutely. Like if like stories sell, right? There's a really good book called Building a Story Brand. But stories sell. If all you do are easy deals, your stories are dog shit. When you have a hard deal, when you like Brad's situation with the backing out and all that stuff, that makes a great story. That makes a great Facebook Live. Like, hey guys, just want to let you know, you know, if you're a first time home buyer out there, I want to give you a story of what happened, blah, blah, blah. Like, you want to bring people along for your journey. Don't tell them how many houses you sold. Nobody gives a shit. Tell them about the problems that you're solving. If you can solve big problems, you'll get big paychecks. Small problems, small paychecks. So if you wanna make a shit ton of money, find the biggest problems you can solve and start solving them. And the rest of everything else will take care of itself. And solve problems after closing. Yes. Something will always come up. I had a client who closed in November, a month, fully remodeled house, turnkey, beautiful. A month later, all the electricity to the lights in the kitchen goes out hidden junction box, something that should maybe have been caught by the inspector, but wasn't brought up. We were both there for the inspection. I went through the inspection report, nothing about a GFI. I, I combed through it very carefully. I got the owner of the inspection company on the phone and I fought with him for 20 minutes saying that had your person pointed out A, I might've brought an electric, electrician to look at B and maybe we wouldn't be here today. So not only did we get the problem fixed, but I also got the entire cost of her inspection refunded and the owner of the company wanted to install her GFIs. So it would be good to go going forward. And even if that doesn't- A month after closing. Yeah, and even if that doesn't matter and that doesn't help and it's just a little bit of money and all that other shit, the effort that Nicole took will always be remembered. Because and guess she, what? I'm not getting sued because I'm on her side. <laughs> because, because she didn't just say, oh, well, not my problem. Good luck. Call the, call the inspection company. I don't know call the home warranty, deal with it, whatever. No, you roll up your sleeves, you get your hands dirty, you fix the problem, you become the hero. If you're the hero, then they're gonna refer you. The whole game is not to make the money. The game is not to make a dollar on the deal. The game is to win their love forever so they give you a shit ton of referrals, right? The dollars you get paid up front are just to break even. If you can do a deal and break even, you're winning. It's all of the future business that you're going to get out of it where you're actually going to make your profit. Any other ahas you guys want to share before we wrap it up? This was fun today. Uh, John, I, I wrote down the, um, to have three good of everything, like three good contractors, three good plumbers, three good electricians. So, uh, it's not even a part of my database that I've even thought about like in somewhere I got to go in terms of start lining up those people. Raise your hand if you're human. It's okay. We all, we all forget stuff, right? We all neglect pieces of our database. We all leave out, you know, a hundred contacts. There's a hundred people that every single one of you know that you do business with that are not in your database. That should never happen. Everyone you know who knows your name, and especially if you spend money at their place of business in any way, shape, or form, 
They need to be in your database. And getting back to those small businesses, I think they will really be forever grateful because so many people almost lost their businesses because of COVID. So if you can help them out right now, they'll be your friend for life. It's not even a question. And if you're getting help as a small business owner, if you learned something, if you learned about PPP, if you're applying for a government loan, if you just had an opportunity to take a class, if you have a great CPA that helped you, whatever you're getting for your small business, pay that forward with all the other small business people in the world that you know, because there's a good chance that they're not being exposed to the same resources that you're being exposed to. And so if now all of a sudden you can go take the PPP provider that gave you the loan because you needed it or whatever, and then you can help 10 other small business owners qualify for that level of funding. Do you know how forever grateful, like there's a guy who helped me get my PPP stuff. I will be forever grateful my entire life for what he did to help me in that moment. So like, don't ever discount that. That's a huge piece of it. Cool. All right, guys, um, same bat time, same bat channel next week. Stay tuned for the information about the stock class next week. We'd love to see you guys all there next Thursday. Um, Dylan, what's your last uh, final word? How do we get the recording of this? Uh, that will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. We're going to start putting more content out there. Um, but I can go ahead, just PM me. If anybody wants a recording of this or anything else, just PM me. I'll send you whatever I've got. So you were serious about the stock class. What's that? Yeah, we're teaching a stock class next week. Um, Meyer is a, you know, our business partner. He's an avid trader. Um, and so we used to do this at uh, our other company. And so we're not going to give you like, hey, you should buy this or you shouldn't buy this or anything like that. We want to teach you basic fundamentals. We want to teach yeah. you what we know about options, how to trade them, how to place them, what account to use, how much money you might want to put in there to risk, um, term, stock, general stock terminology. Oh, Basically, good. Yeah, we want to give you enough so that if we told you what we were doing, you would understand it and you might be able to benefit from it too. So if I told you like, hey, I bought a March 5th, $6 call on Nokia yeah. uh, and I bought it, you know, I bought it for 600 bucks. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to jump in on it too, you'd know what that means. And you know, and if I said, hey, I exited and I sold it for this or whatever, if I, if you don't understand the language, then you're not going to be able to benefit from what we're doing. So totally. I'll PM you for more info. Cool. We'll have it out there. Thanks, guys. This was fun. If you guys need any additional special one-on-one -on -one attention or anything else, just let me know. I'm happy to help you guys out outside of this. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, John. Bye.